Hello, so my name is Kyo Sarantoglu Lalis and I'm an architect. Concurrently with designing my projects, I've been involved in academic research. I've been teaching in Europe and, and in the US. And what I would like to discuss today is the relationship between creative thinking and the way we produce new ideas and skills and different forms of knowledge through our engagement with technology. In architecture, the beginning of the, the 20th century saw the gradual decline of uh, or, um, craftsmanship and the gradual rise of industrialization. As a result, the homogenization of the built environment of our cities and the fact that when we travel from Toronto to, to Lille or Frankfurt, all buildings look the same uh, is a result of that industrialization. Uh, another environmental impact is that this only relies on, on a global supply chain. So like the clothes we wear or the food we eat, how far do those building products need to travel until we can, we can use them? And what's their real carbon footprint? So when I uh, graduated from architecture school at the end of the 90s, we were designing everything by hand. And then came the computer. And with the computer came a series of uh, design software that allowed us to design more complex form and to experiment. Now, in the beginning, the construction industry wasn't ready for that. It hadn't quite caught up with those changes, which is why a few architects started looking outside the construction industry in the field of shipbuilding and car, car design. Um, this is a pioneering example of transfer of technology. This is Future Systems Media Center at Lourdes. It was, it was built in uh, 1999 and was entirely constructed by a shipyard. Now, this uh, strategy enabled to materialize some new ideas, but at the same time, it was reserved to a handful of exceptional projects. Um, what I'm personally interested in is how can we de democratize those techniques? Uh, how can we use uh, state-of-the-art digital design and manufacturing on normal commissions, like a house or a nursery? Well, we can design books, we can print them in our house, we can edit uh, uh, films and do music. And one of the questions I was asking myself is, if I design a building with my computer, can I manufacture it in my basement? So basically, I decided to buy this uh, digital cutting machine about a decade ago to understand how this, the, the, basically the connection between software and those industrial machines could affect or transform the way we do architecture. So, one of the major changes it brought is that it basically led to paperless construction sites. I'll explain what that is. Basically, architects usually do plans, sections, and details, and then they hand it over to a construction company that will build it. Whereas here, we design things in 3D, and they get directly manufactured uh, through the use of those machines. A second important change is the ability to test ideas and prototype in our, in our workspace, so in our studio, we can design something in 3D and immediately test it and see if it works and if it's interesting. Now, what I'm very interested in is through the, for every project, we can now invent new construction strategies that basically escape the, the homogenization of those building components or those material catalogs that architects use and that make all buildings look the same. Uh, while making uh, things affordable as well. So one of the advantages of working that way is that you avoid the catalog, it empowers creativity, and at the same time you can work with locally supplied materials. So another interesting idea is the idea of design integration. In this example, the music chamber of Isfahan in integrates uh, acoustics, structure, and elements of culture into one form. We were able to test this idea on a project uh, called Pocket Nursery, which is basically an active learning uh, nursery. It's, just, it's a prefabricated classroom that we designed with my friend Yannick Deneyer here in, in Belgium. And one of the main ideas of this project is that the project's made out of a wall, a library, that basically holds the building together. So instead of having a column and a piece of furniture standing in front of it, why not integrate the two? 
And basically, the whole project was conceived as a Swiss knife, if you want, like a series of functions that are programmed against the wall that would have tables and other elements of pedagogy. So uh, basically, we designed the project in 3D in such a way that it could, be man it could be assembled in only three minutes, from that point to that point, without the use of, the use of a manual and uh, any specific skill. We had 25 modules to assemble. It took about four days for two people to pre-assemble them. And then they were shipped on site. And in just two days, you had a closed, closed nursery classroom, a little bit, bit, bit smaller than this space. Um, this is how the digital file looks, like we designed it in 3D. All the parts are different and they're labeled. We don't need to, to standardize, to use similar uh, structural elements. They can all be different. And this is how it looks before the file is laid flat and uh, cut digitally. Now, one important, another important change is if we were to design a project like that, or if architects were to design a project like that in Mexico or Peru, we wouldn't have to ship the parts of the building. We could just email the cutting files and use locally sourced materials that would be cut by, uh, by the machines over there. So as I said, the, the, the nursery is an active learning space, which means learning happens through physical engagement with the space. Uh, the base of the wall at the height of the children was, was, had an educational function. So the sloping walls are for children to learn how to draw. There were some ladders for toddlers to learn how to stand on their feet. The windows are, were at the height of children. And basically, the architecture and the, the form of the architecture was an integral part of the pedagogy of that uh, Montessori nursery. Another, another interesting case study for us was the Villa Ypsilon. Now, the Villa Ypsilon is a, is, a, is a summer house in Greece. It was manufactured in less than seven months. And its construction cost was somewhere around 1,300 euros a square meter. On a side note, a project of that level of complexity, if using a traditional method, would have cost three or four times that budget. Now, in terms of the main ideas, uh, we, instead of producing uh, an object that's sitting on the ground, like all those summer residences that you can see, we, d we conceive the house as an extension of the terrain, an extension of the landscape. Its Y-shaped roof creates three courtyards that can be, uh, basically can activate the whole periphery of the house rather than only the, the panoramic view. As you can see, it's possible to circulate above and around the house very freely over the garden. We designed the form of the roof in such a way that it would cast precise shadows in those courtyards. And so in the, in the west courtyard, for example, you would have shadow up till 11.30 so that people can have breakfast, and the shadow would shift at 1 p.m. precisely to the east for lunch, and then the southern courtyard would be protected from the, the evening sun. Another thing we did is using geolocalization as a way to frame precise views from the landscape. Now, one of the important features of the house is that it blends with its, with its uh, topography. So we decided to use a very thin concrete shell that was using locally sourced material. And one of the main challenges was the, was the production of the formwork. So here it is. It's a, it's a very big puzzle that was digitally de designed in the computer. It is composed of 5,000 parts that are all different. And it was conceived in such a way that it didn't require the use of screws, tools, or manual. That meant that when it was assembled, it was put together in only uh, in less than a week, but by four people. After the concrete was poor, the formwork was left to act as a, an acoustic ceiling. And the same method that was used to produce the form of the building was used to produce uh, small formwork for uh, small molds for the lighting that was integrated in the ceiling. Other elements, like the showers, were also digitally carved. Uh, and they actually ended up costing the same price as an industrial product of similar dimensions. We also uh, uh, produced a series of bespoke uh, window frames which enabled to, to give some porosity to the western facade to prevent 
uh, too much uh, sun from the evening. And on the inside, uh, as you can see, the effect is a there's a theatrical lighting effect on the, on the corridor wall. Uh, we were able, through this method, to manufacture uh, all sorts of items like screens, libraries, beds, and everything. And finally, we, we used very few off-the-shelf products. So we designed our, our, our full palette of materials and, uh, and techniques and, and uh, just, just relied on locally sourced materials. So what do these examples have to tell us about the role of technology? Now, the role of technology has been a subject of debate and polarization, not only in architecture, but I think in society at large. Uh, we hear every day conversations about how robots and AI are going to take our jobs. I think we, we should hear more about, about what new jobs are being created and how jobs are being, or practices are being transformed by this technology. At the same time, I agree that we need to problematize technology, I think it can be a source of, uh, of alienation. I think we have to be quite serious about that. This is uh, Gary Kasparov uh, losing a notorious chess match against IBM's Deep Blue computer in 1997. And what I find absolutely fascinating about this event is that what may seem at first as a great defeat is concurrently a great victory for human intelligence. And so, as Paul Viry would say, when we invent the locomotive, we simultaneously invent the possibility of derailment. And I think that without risk-taking and experimentation, there would be no civilization. Through our continuous interaction with technology and, and technological objects, we not only produce new skills and knowledge, but also our culture. This is what makes us human, after all. Thank you. <laughs>